And I'm just going to pause and let people begin to stream in. Welcome everyone to tonight's ACPMP webinar. We'll get started in just a minute. We're letting people stream on in from the lobby. So come on in, get comfortable, and we'll get going in just a minute or two. Welcome everyone to tonight's ACPMP webinar. We're just letting people come on in from the lobby. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. Welcome everyone. I see we're right at seven o'clock. We've got people logging in now, coming in from the lobby. So uh, welcome to the ACPMP webinar. We will get started in just a couple of minutes. Very happy to have you all join. Welcome everyone to the ACPMP webinar. Glad to have you. We will get started in just a minute or two. We're letting people come on in from the lobby. Looks like people are streaming in. Happy to have you.
All right, I think we can go ahead and get started. I've got almost 7.05. Welcome everyone to tonight's ACPMP webinar. My name is Deborah Shelton and I am the Executive Director for the Appendix Cancer PMP Research Foundation or ACPMP. ACPMP is a nonprofit organization that serves the diverse appendix cancer community. And ACPMP's mission is twofold. One, we fund and support promising research with the hope of one day finding a cure for appendix cancer. And two, ACPMP funds and supports educational programs for physicians, patients, caregivers, and families to keep up with current science, current uh, technologies, it's all rapidly evolving, and to keep up with best practices. I wanna say that all of this work is made possible solely through donations. Donations really are at the crux of everything that we do. And so we very much appreciate the generosity of our donors. We are grateful for every single dollar. I do wanna put in a shameless plug that our annual walk, uh, which is our key fundraiser, is still going on. It's in effect through Sunday. And if you'd like to participate, make a donation to that, there is still time to do that. You can do that by visiting our website at acpmp.org. Okay. Now, tonight's program is part of our educational webinar series. But before I introduce our guest tonight, Dr. John Paul Shen, let me just take a minute for a couple of very brief housekeeping announcements. Um, one, there will be a question and answer session uh, following Dr. Shen's presentation. He will be answering questions. Please, if you have questions as Dr. Shen is presenting, put them in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Do not use the chat feature. The chat feature is not enabled. So we will not be able to see your questions. Please submit them through the Q&A function box at the bottom. Please know that um, all of the, hang on one second. Please note that all that we did have as part of the registration process, a lot of questions um, come through as pre-submits. So there are already many, many questions in the queue. Dr. Shan, of course, will do his level best to answer as many as he can in the time that we have. Um, all of your lines are muted to reduce background noise. Please note that this presentation is being recorded and it will be available to you through the same Zoom link that you use tonight to join. And last but not least, we invite anyone, if you have topics, presenters that you would like to see covered going forward in one of our webinar programs, please feel free to reach out and let me know at deborahs at acpmp.org. That is on your screen now. I'm always happy to help, so reach out anytime. Uh, myself and my colleagues can answer any questions that you have. Okay. And with that, I am very, very happy to introduce our guest presenter tonight, Dr. John Paul Shen. Dr. Shen will be talking to us about appendiceal cancer is not the same as colon cancer, implications for chemotherapy. Dr. Shen is a physician scientist with a scientific background in chemical biology and clinical training in internal medicine hematology, and oncology. He trained at MIT and the Broad Institute and is currently an assistant professor in the Department of Gastrointestinal Medical Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. His clinical practice is focused on appendix and colon cancers. His long-term research goal is to better understand the cancer genome and to leverage that understanding to better the delivery of chemotherapy. 
His immediate research goals include the discovery of new synthetic genetic relationships as a means to both repurpose already FDA-approved drugs and also to identify new chemotherapeutic drug targets. He's also actively involved in several projects to identify genomic biomarkers to predict which specific patients will respond to a given therapy. His research builds on his prior training in chemical biology and high throughput screening, functional genomics, and the creation of genetic interaction networks, as well as clinical oncology. Dr. Shen is a thoughtful and responsive collaborator to ACPMP, and we're all lucky uh, in the community to have him on our side. Dr. Shen, the floor is yours. All right, so let me just uh, share these. Okay, um, we're, uh, we're all seeing now the this first slide. Awesome. Okay, so uh, so so Deborah, thanks so much uh, for that kind introduction. Uh, very excited to be here today. Uh, thanks everyone in the audience uh, for for tuning in. Um, yeah, as was mentioned, um, there's the use the question and answer um, bubble if questions come up, and we'll try to address these uh, at the end. Um, you know, um, in addition to being a clinician, as Deborah mentioned, uh, I lead a lab of about 14 people uh, here at MD Anderson. Um, that's that's us pictured uh, at our at our holiday party last year. Um, and the basic idea is that um, you know cancer is very complex and heterogeneous, and the the reason that cancer is so hard to treat and that there's not, you know, a cure for cancer already is that cancer isn't just one disease, it's it's a million different diseases. Um, if you look at it at one level, every tumor is unique, um, but it's not really practical to have a new drug for every person. Um, but at the same time, the current approach, which is to basically give all patients with colon cancer the same drugs, is, is also not going to work because it's going to work for some people, but but not everyone. And so uh, you know, what we try to do by, you know, understanding what makes the cancer cancer, understanding the genome of the tumor, uh, we hope to better identify, you know, who is going to respond to a drug in advance so we can, you know, give them that drug and identify who is not going to respond so, so we know, um, you know, what therapies are ineffective. Um, you know, we're... Uh, probably doing too many things at the same time, which which is, uh, you know, why we're not quite done with as much as as we wanted, but um, our, we try to split the lab kind of roughly in, into three groups. We have uh, one third roughly are computational scientists. So these are people who are computer scientists or computational biologists who are experts in analyzing big data. Uh, you know, we have a project where we have uh, in colon cancer 150 cells uh, where every cell has been um, uh, sequenced individually. Uh, give, giving us like over 2 billion data points. And with that, we we're, we're, we think we can understand, um, you know, why tumors become resistant after they initially get chemotherapy. Uh, one third of the lab is experimental, and, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this more because this is really where a lot of our work in appendix cancer is. We've built uh, for the first time a preclinical model so we can start testing what drugs actually work for appendix cancer uh, in mice and in cell lines. Um, and then, and then the third part is translational. And so we have a team of three um, uh, physicians who trained uh, overseas who are uh, pursuing a research fellowship before they uh, complete more clinical training in the United States. And so uh, we're trying to learn from you know all the patients that we treat you know here at MD Anderson and and uh, across the country. And so um, by capture by capturing all of the information on each patient in a you know organized and machine readable way, we can go back and look retrospectively and see you know what drugs work for what patients when you know what genes were mutated, et cetera, so that we can better um, you know better predict what's going to work uh, for people in the future. Um, so um, initially, I, I was thinking that we would try to split the time of you know roughly half uh, questions and half. Um, content, what we'll see as I was putting this together, um, I was like, realized, oh, we should add that, we should add this. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll get through this um, uh, and, and leave a good 45 minutes for questions. Uh, this is kind of a rough outline. Um, the, um, you know, 
normally when you tell people that you study appendix cancer, the, the first question that you get is, you know, one, I, I didn't know there was such a thing as appendix cancer, uh, which, you know, to this crowd, I, I'm sure you guys are unfortunately well aware. Um, and, you know, the second most common question that you get is, why don't you just remove the appendix? Um, you know, unfortunately, most of the time, you know, by the time that um, it's discovered that someone has appendix cancer, the, the tumor has spread throughout the abdomen or what we call the peritoneal space. Uh, and so removing the appendix is, is no longer um, going to be helpful. Um, the, you know, you know, one of the, the, the major missions of our lab, and we have collaborators um, both at Memorial Sloan Kettering and, and we're kind of building a team across the country is that um, in 2023, if you look up the national treatment guidelines for appendix cancer, they, they still tell you that you should treat them the same as, as colon cancer. And so, um, you know, why that is, is it's, it's kind of hard to say. I think that, um, you know, this goes back to probably the, the 1960s, really, when uh, we had very little in the way of ability to do molecular uh, testing of, of tumors. And the appendix is anatomically next to the colon, and it expresses some of the same genes. Um, so it probably originated um, uh, embryologically from the same tissue, um, but that's not really a good reason um, to, to treat it with colon cancer chemotherapy, and that's that's what we're going to talk about later. Um, again, you, this this audience may um, be be all too well aware of this is that you know even though appendix cancer is rare, the the, the incidence is growing. Uh, unfortunately, it's it's more than doubled in in the last decade. Um, we think there's now about four thousand five hundred new cases every year. Uh, unfortunately, appendix cancer remains an orphan disease, which means there, there's no FDA-approved drugs specifically for appendix cancer. Um, obviously, patients with appendix cancer are treated with drugs, but no one has ever shown in a group of just appendix cancer patients that um, you know that a single drug is effective. And that's that's you know one of the things that we're also trying to change. Um, the, the other kind of scary thing is that appendix cancer seems to affect um, younger and younger people. Um, you know, the, the little box there is kind of showing you that there's been a 25% increase in the cases that happen in the people under, under the age of 50. Um, and you, in the news, you're probably hearing about um, early onset colorectal cancer, but actually a lot of that is driven by, by appendix cancer that's just kind of grouped into the colon cancer in, in some of these national statistics. Um, so I really kind of first started working um, in appendix cancer in 2017, and, and this paper was published in 2018. Uh, we worked with a company called Foundation Medicine, which was one of the first um, companies to do tumor sequencing. And they had a, a, a large group of appendix cancer uh, tumors that had been sequenced, and we, we analyzed this. And, and you can see very clearly um, the mutations that you see in appendix cancer are very different than the mutations that you see in colon cancer. Um, and when you think about it, appendix cancer behaves very differently than colon cancer. Colon cancer, you know, spreads first to lymph nodes and then to the liver in 70% of cases. Um, you know, mucinous appendix cancer almost never spreads into lymph nodes. And, and I think I've seen maybe one case where it spread into the liver itself. Um, so that it, it, it uh, behaves very differently. Um, and, and it turns out it's, it's mutations are very different. And so in colon cancer, the most commonly mutated gene is generally APC, uh, followed by P53, and uh, KRAS is mutated about half the time. Uh, GNAS is very rarely mutated. Um, appendix cancer is very different. So first off, and, and we'll talk more about this a little bit later, is that you know appendix cancer is not only rare, uh, it, it's very heterogeneous. So within, you know, SRCC is signet ring, uh, cell carcinoma, um, adenocarcinoma, sometimes called adenocarcinoma not otherwise specified, and mucinous adenocarcinoma. Those are all different types of appendix cancer, and you can see that the the rate of genetic mutation in these groups is is quite different. That uh, the mucinous tumors tend to have more GNAS mutation. Uh, the signet ring cell tumors tend to have more p53 mutation, uh, but none of them have very frequent APC mutation. Um, and so based on that, you know, honestly, I have to say it just really bothered me that um, we had this very, you know, 
there are very clear data that at a molecular basis, appendix cancer is very different than colon cancer. And it really just bothered me that we were giving uh, these patients the exact same chemotherapy um, that the colon cancer patients got. Um, and, and that's really kind of led our efforts to, to how, you know, how we can develop ways to, to make treatment specifically for appendix cancer and, and to better understand the differences between appendix cancer. And so the, the other, you know, one of the questions from the, uh, from the, you know, people had the ability to, to send questions in advance. And one of them was, what are the things that we should look for in a path report? And, um, you know, the most, the, the grade is critically important. It's hard to say the most important, the, the stage, stage, which is how far your tumor has spread, early stage versus late stage is important. Uh, unfortunately, most of the time, um, you know, when people discover they have appendix cancer, it's already spread to the peritoneum, which makes it uh, stage four, like the picture you see there is a stage four uh, tumor. Um, but within stage four tumors, there's huge difference in terms of how long people live based on the grade. And so that's what you're seeing on the left there. And so um, we'll put a few more of these plots in the picture, but this is called the Kaplan-Meier plot. And so um, at time zero, everyone is alive. We have 100% of people alive. And as time progresses, um, you know, people un un unfortunately die. And so you can see that um, if you have a poorly differentiated, also called a high-grade tumor, um, the, the median survival is, is 42 months, whereas it's 76 months uh, with a moderately differentiated tumor and 138 months um, with a well differentiated or low grade tumor. And so that's a huge, I mean, huge you know, almost three times uh, difference um, in terms of how long you'd expect to live based on, on the grade, which is determined uh, by a pathologist based on what the tumor looks like under the microscope. And, and th this, this point is going to be really important when we talk about uh, whether or not chemotherapy is effective, because it turns out that um, the molecular features of low grade are very different than high grade and the response to chemotherapy is also very different. And so really, they're, they're really two different diseases that both happen to, to live in the appendix. Um, so I'm, I'm a medical oncologist. I'm, I'm the doctor that, that prescribes chemotherapy, but we work very closely um, with surgeons. Uh, you know, one of the reasons that we saw a lot of appendiceal cancer patients in San Diego was, was because it's a center of surgical excellence. Uh, and that's the same reason that we see so many appendix cancer patients uh, here at MD Anderson is, is again, um, you know, it's a center of surgical excellence. Um, the, the best treatment that we have right now is to remove all the tumor. That's called a complete cytoreductive surgery. Uh, and that could, what actually has to be removed in that surgery is going to depend based on where the tumor is located. Um, you know, it could be part of the intestines, it could be part of the bladder, it could be um, part of the abdominal wall, um, the omentum, uh, the ovaries, um, and then then followed by heated intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Um, but uh, unfortunately, if the if the tumor is already if the cancer is kind of already too spread across the abdomen, if which is measured by this thing called the PCI score, peritoneal carcinomatosis index. If the PCI score is, is high, a lot of times in, in the 20s, meaning there's tumor kind of in all the, the quadrants of the abdomen, um, there's frequently too much tumor that the surgeons can't remove all of it. Uh, and, and unfortunately, um, the recommendation is, is, is only for, is, is for chemotherapy. And that's, and that's when, you know, that's when they come to me. Um, so, so kind of going back to that theme that not all appendix cancer is the same, th this is now a plot where this is going, this is data from that same uh, 2018 paper uh, where we look to see, okay, we saw the ratio, the frequency of the mutations were different in different groups, uh, but then we wanted to look at what genes are mutated together. Uh, we call that um, co-mutated and what genes are not mutated together, and that's called mutually exclusive. And so uh, it turns out very interestingly that the, the chance, like if you have a gene ass mutation, the chance that you also have a KRAS mutation is very high. Uh, and you can see here that gene ass is more common when the tumor is mucinous. Um, but if you, you can kind of see here that when you have a gene ass mutation, it's unlikely that you have a P53 mutation. 
So the way you read this basically is each bar is one patient. And so um, if the bars overlap, the mutations are in the same patient. If the bars don't overlap like GNAS and P53, you can see that the mutations are in different patients. So the people that are having P53 mutations are generally not the same as, as GNAS. And um, this has become important because using this, uh, we can start to develop subtypes uh, using just this mutation data, which, which is now you know, readily obtained at, at most cancer centers. You can either send the uh, tissue off to one of many commercial vendors or many hospitals will have their own in-house sequencing, um, you know, like at MD Anderson or, or at Sloan Kettering. So the data on the left is from um, a, a friend and collaborator, uh, Dr. Foote, who is um, an appendix cancer specialist uh, at Memorial Sloan Kettering in New York. Um, and so they basically found that by splitting the patients into four groups, like those with RAS mutation, uh, GNAS and KRAS mutation, P53 mutation, or, or none of the above, you, you got a big split in terms of the outcome. Um, we, we had similar data here in a slightly larger patient cohort. Um, and with this, we were starting to better make predictions about um, you know, how aggressive uh, your tumor is based on, on the mutations. The again, it would kind of emphasize we're very kind of early days with with understanding this, um, and and we're hoping to to learn more about this. Um, th this is a very active area of research. Um, you know, just knowing that um, when gene X is mutated, the survival is better or worse is a little bit helpful. But really, what we want to know is what drugs are going to you know be effective against this tumor, uh, and what drugs are not going to be effective, and and you know, very interestingly, uh, GNAS mutant tumors tend to be very drug resistant. And so um, in this plot, you can see, um, you know, red is stable, um, blue is regression, meaning the tumor got smaller, um, and progression, meaning the tumor got bigger, like only 5%, of, this was only about 20 patients in this column. So basically one out of 20 patients that had a GNAS mutation um, had an objective response, meaning tumor actually got smaller while on chemotherapy. Uh, we, we've repeated the same analysis here at MD Anderson, and so we this was all kind of chemo mixed together. Here we split out by different regimens, and we can see that um, in our cohort, the response rate overall was about 15%, so it was a little bit better than what we than what was seen at, at Sloan Kettering, and um, part of that seemed to be driven by people that got arena TCAN, so full, full theory is 5-FU plus arena TCAN whereas full FOX is oxaliplatin uh, plus um, 5-FU, the arena TCAN regimen seem to do better in these GNAS mutant tumors. So um, this is kind of an overview um, of, of where we're at. You know, unfortunately, we're, we're really early days in terms of what we know about appendix cancer relative to, um, to, to colon cancer. It's more common um, relative. But um, you know the the this next story that we want to get out is is really um, I think convincing and I think is going to change the way that um, low grade uh, patients are treated. So um, this uh, first I, I want to give credit to um, Alderman Yusuf who was a postdoc in the lab and also um, the names are very small there but uh, Kamal Ragav uh, and Mike Overman who are medical oncologists and, and Keith Fournier a, a surgeon. Uh, they actually started this trial all the way back in um, 2012, uh, you know, well before I, I got to MD Anderson. Um, it took eight years to recruit 24 patients. Um, but the, the idea behind this trial is that um, just from giving chemotherapy to patients with low-grade appendix cancers, it didn't seem that, you know, the tumors were really shrinking ever. Uh, it didn't seem that people were benefiting, and so we wanted to address this in a you know prospective, um, randomized fashion. And so, uh, the way this trial worked is that um, it was only for again not all appendix cancer, but I wouldn't really want to emphasize you know not not high grade tumors. This was low grade mucinous tumors only. Um, you know people that were inoperable, um, and then people were randomized to either getting chemotherapy first, and then crossing over and getting, and then crossing over to observation or getting observation for six months and then crossing over to chemo. So everyone got six months of chemo and everyone got six months of observation. 
Um, and then the, the key endpoint was, does the tumor grow faster while you're getting chemo than, or does it grow faster while you're getting observation or, or is it the same? And so the hypo our hypothesis was that we didn't think the chemotherapy was doing anything. And, and we thought that the, the growth of the tumors would be the same um, during the observation time versus the, uh, the treatment time. And, and, and that's actually what we found. So um, on uh, the far left, I also want to put that this, this is now published, uh, was published just a month ago. And I believe that um, Deborah has put the link on the ACPMP website. Um, you can also search uh, the journal JAMA Network open uh, and you'll find it. Um, so what we're showing here on the left is basically the percent change in the tumor size during the intervals where the person was on observation or on treatment. Um, basically, we did a scan every three months. Um, here, you on the middle here, you can see this is a timeline. So this is in the beginning, three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. Uh, each line is one patient. And so you can see that a flat line means the tumor is not growing. Um, a line that is rising indicates that the tumor is growing. Um, and so from this, you can see that in general, low-grade appendix cancer is a slow-growing disease. Um, you know, for most of these lines, the line is very flat. Um, the tumor just grows slowly, and it doesn't really matter if you're getting chemotherapy or not. You know, you, you know, like if you look at this green line here, um, you know, the, the rate of change really no different. Uh, treatment or observation, and and you see the same thing here, and so the um, so the, the important conclusion here is that the the, the chemotherapy is really not doing anything um, for these low grade patients, and unfortunately, um, in in colon cancer world, if you the colon cancer is a much faster growing, much more aggressive tumor than low grade appendix cancer. Um, if you're giving chemotherapy to someone with colon cancer and you're seeing that the tumor is staying roughly the same, you would call that stable disease and you would generally continue them on treatment uh, because the assumption is that if you didn't give them any chemotherapy, their tumor would, would be growing. But, but that assumption is really not true in, again, just low-grade appendix cancer because as you can see during the observation periods, you know, the vast majority of these tumors are not growing significantly. Um, also, important point here is that everyone here got a 5-FU based chemotherapy. Some patients got just 5-FU. Some people got 5-FU plus oxaliplatin. Uh, some people got the oral version of 5-FU, which is called capecitabine. Uh, but there actually were no, no patients here got lorinotecan. So an important, important point. Um, and this is, so um, in, the, in this slide, um, each patient is one line. Um, now, here we wanted to look at what, what was the actual um, depth of response. And so to be, called, um, to be called a response, the tumor has to be at least 20% smaller uh, than when it started. And as you can see here, not a single patient um, out of 18 achieved an objective response. Um, so um, anything between zero and 20% bigger is called stable disease. There were 14 patients with stable disease. And there were four that had progression, uh, you, you know, tumor got bigger um, while they were on chemotherapy. And, you know, this was a small trial. This was only 18 patients. But, you know, you also have to take into consideration that there has never been a prospective trial that shows that 5-FU actually does work for appendix cancer. It, the only reason that 5-FU was being used uh, in appendix cancer is because it works in colon cancer. But as, as I showed you in the beginning, appendix cancer is very different than colon cancer. And so, um, you know, if you if there was a phase one trial and out of 18 patients, not a single patient, you know, had their tumor shrink, that drug would never be tried again, you know, in a phase two or, or later trial because it is just not working. And so um, we we feel that based on, on this evidence, you know, that um, 5-FU treatment should really not be used in, in low-grade um, appendix cancer. Um, you know, part of this study also is that um, the patients were asked to take quality of life uh, surveys where they asked, you know, many, many different questions about side effects, et cetera. And, you know, not surprisingly, uh, people were more fatigued, um, had more neuropathy, had, had financial issues, 
while getting chemotherapy versus not. So, um, you know, a bit, um, you know, the, so it's a ne negative data and, and don't want to get people's, um, don't want to, uh, to be too depressing, but we, we think that's really important just because unfortunately at MD Anderson, we get patients referred to us um, who have been with low grade, um, you know, mucinous tumors who have been on chemotherapy for a long time, sometimes years, uh, and, and they're very, um, you know, sick from just being on chemotherapy for so long. And so we're, we're really hoping that um, as this paper is is disseminated, that that you know that that will that will stop, and that you know people will identify one that hey, we don't have to keep giving chemotherapy to these low grade tumors. Um, we can kind of watch them and only give them treatment when they're starting to progress, um, or that you know we should we should at least try other other therapies that might be effective. Um, you know the fact that five FU. Uh, or 5-FU plus oxaliplatin doesn't work in these tumors doesn't mean that uh, nothing will work in these tumors. Uh, it just means we need to try something else. Okay, so, um, you know, the a big part of the reason that no one has ever, you know, developed a drug specifically for appendix cancer is that if you want to do drug discovery, you need to be able to test your drugs, you know, in, in preclinical models, right, before you can get to a clinical trial. Um, you know, if I went to the FDA and said, I want to, you know, do this trial uh, in appendix cancer, and, you know, the FDA would say, okay, well, what data do you have that suggests that this will work in appendix cancer? And if, and if you don't have any, um, you're, you're not going to be doing that trial uh, for good reason. Um, so this plot here, you can, this is a, called a UMAP plot, which is kind of a fancy way to um, take a lot of data and kind of compress it into two dimensions. But the, the point here is that appendix, when we put appendix cancer and colon cancer, they, they separate that, uh, you know, if appendix cancer was similar to colon cancer, these, these dots would basically be intermixed with uh, colon cancer, but, but they separate. Um, and so one of the, the major um, research priorities that we've had is we said, let's, let's, you know, these models don't exist, let's make them. Um, and, you know, in large part due to the um, collaboration with our surgeons who, who've been really amazing in terms of um, getting us access uh, to the operating room. Uh, it used to be I would physically go to the operating room um, and they would, you know, what during the surgery when the tumor would come out, um, you know, obviously we consent the patient uh, ahead of time. Um, we'd collect the tumor in a in a sterile jar, and then we'd walk it over to the lab and and implant it into mice. Now, now actually, uh, Dr. Youssef does this, um, which, which is great. Um, but um, we've we've actually had a lot of success in in taking human tumors and planting them into mice um, and growing them out, and that now allows us to test many different drugs um, in the in these mouse models. And so. Um, the, the, this picture is just kind of showing you that um, what we're getting in the mice actually is a pretty good um, uh, representation of what happens in humans. You, you probably remember that picture I had from the surgeons that, um, you know, in humans, appendix cancer forms this usually mucinous kind of gelatinous uh, metastatic spread throughout the peritoneal space. And that's what we're getting now in mice. Um, this is the actual mice cut open. Um, this is the tumor taken out of the mice, and then this is what it looks like uh, under the microscope. Um, and, and so doing that, we've, we've, we found one therapy that we're, we're very excited about and um, is, is hopefully soon moving into a clinical trial. Um, our goal is to have this clinical trial open um, before the end of the calendar year. Um, it, it's um, a little bit, um, it, honestly, I, I'm a Anyone that knows me knows I'm an impatient person by nature, um, and, and clinical research unfortunately grinds very slowly. Um, just given the 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 you know, kind of checks and balances that that happen, uh, but we're we're hopeful that we'll be able to enroll our first patients, um, you know, maybe November, uh, December of this year. Uh, but we, what we found is that um, if you so paclitaxel is an old drug. Um, it was actually discovered uh, from the bark of the Pacific yew tree um, a long time ago. It, it works in many cancers, uh, breast cancer, um, some heme malignancies, but it also works in esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, and small bowel cancer. 
um, really the, the outlier there is colon cancer. So paclitaxel has been tried in colon cancer and it doesn't work in colon cancer. Uh, but colon cancer is really the only uh, GI tract tumor where, where it doesn't work. Um, you know, because of this kind of outdated notion that appendix cancer patients should get colon cancer chemo, people have not really tried um, paclitaxel in appendix cancer, but but we're, we're showing here that that is actually quite effective. And so, um, so this is, so there's kind of two novel ideas here. One is that, you know, just using this drug paclitaxel in appendix cancer has not really been done before. But instead of putting it intravenously, we, we inject it directly into the, the IP space. So it's, it's a little bit like um, when you think about HIPEC, where the, the chemo is going directly into the peritoneal space. And so um, we are, we're very excited to open this trial. Um, the, um, the, the, the plan of the trial you can see here, um, the, um, a collaborator, Dr. Brian Badgewell at MD Anderson has done a very similar trial in gastric cancer. Um, and that has really, that's demonstrated that it's safe to, to, you know, putting the catheters in, uh, which have to be done surgically. Um, you have to do a diagnostic laparoscopy and that's how you can place, uh, an intraperitoneal port. So it's similar to the ports that I'm sure many of you have, but except instead of ending up near your heart in the you know, to put it into the veins, the, the other end of the port is into the peritoneal space. So the chemo goes directly uh, into the peritoneal space, which is where appendix cancer uh, lives. Um, the, we would then do serial, you know, every two week dosing. So you'd get just like you would get your full Fox or full theory every two weeks, you'd get your uh, paclitaxel every two weeks, but again, into the peritoneal space. And then um, at the end of three months, there would be another a diagnostic uh, surgery to evaluate how much tumor is left. Um, you know, if, if possible, um, if enough tumor had shrunk, you know, we potentially would consider um, doing a CRS high at that point. Um, or if it looked like the tumor was responding, but, you know, it was still not possible to do surgery, then then we'd continue with the, with the treatment. And so, um, and if you want more details, you can you can look up the the gastric uh, trial um, at clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so we, so far, so in mice we've done this um, in in three mice, three out of three. Um, so here each uh, so so three sorry so the different names here so PDX one ten eleven means that's three different human tumors that have been implanted into mice. Each dot is one individual mouse. Uh, and you can see that um, if you give the mice just nothing, um, the tumors grow. Uh, but if you give them paclitaxel, um, in, in the case of um, model number 10, we, we got virtually all the tumor um, eradicated, which you can see in the picture here, um, but very robust response in, in models 1 and 11. Um, interestingly, um, models 10 and 11 both have the KRAS GNAS mutation combination. Again, that's the one that I showed you was drug resistant, um, you know, maybe a 10% response rate to, to full FOX or full theory. Uh, and so we're excited that this might be a strategy um, for these very mucinous uh, GNAS mutant tumors tend to be the most mucinous ones. Um, so we're excited that this might be a therapy um, for these patients that, that really aren't responding very well. Um, to, to the 5 fu based chemo. Uh, so this paper has not officially been accepted yet, but we think it will be soon. Um, but you, the, the preprint is available on BioArchive um, if you'd want to, to read more about that. Okay. Um, we've also, um, so again, we're, we're excited to bring that uh, trial into the clinic, but, but it's slow. Uh, we've also um, started um, treating some patients with intravenous paclitaxel, um, just, just off-label. Um, so off-label means that you're using an FDA-approved drug um, for something other than its indication. Um, but as I said at the beginning, there's no drugs that are indicated specifically for appendix cancer. That's what makes appendix cancer an orphan disease. So really, any, any chemo that you use for appendix cancer is already off-label. So picking, you know, picking a gastric cancer drug instead of a colon cancer drug really um, you know, really isn't any any different. And so we, we've actually had um, no issues from an insurance company, uh, you know, approval or denial, uh, which has been great. Uh, I think partially because paclitaxel is an old and, and cheap drug, 
Um, it, so this paper is not, um, we're writing this up. This is mostly my, um, you know, it's been sitting on my desk. Unfortunately, I need, I need to, to finish this and submit this. But um, out of 13 patients that have been treated with um, some form of paclitaxel, so some, some just the original paclitaxel, some with uh, NAB paclitaxel, which is also called the Braxane, uh, which is used for breast cancer, sorry, uh, used for ovarian cancer and uh, pancreas cancer. Um, about a third of the patients responded, um, which may not sound like a lot, but but a third of patients in you know heavily so heavily pretreated means these are patients who have already um, you know experienced multiple lines of chemotherapy, and unfortunately those are the you know most refractory and and hardest to treat tumors. Um, in patients who had already had a lot of chemotherapy, we still had a third of the patients respond, and we had two patients that were treated frontline. Uh, you can see number five um, responded. This patient actually got that regimen because they also had um, a lung cancer. So uh, carbopatin, paclitaxel, prembolizumab is a, is a lung cancer regimen, uh, but their goblet cell uh, appendix cancer responded very well. Um, and the other patient we had that was treated first line also had a very nice response. And so we think that, um, you know, while again, most excited about the intraperitoneal paclitaxel, a trial that we hope to open, um, you know, we think that um, intravenous paclitaxel is another option, um, you know, for, for patients, which, which is important given how, how limited the, the chemotherapy options are in this disease. Um, okay, so, so what's the future? I, so, I mean, the, you know, as, as a scientist and a researcher, I'm very excited about the future. I think that um, the future is very bright uh, for appendix cancer. Um, you, you know, I, every Thursday I see appendix cancer patients in clinic. My, my clinic is, is roughly 50-50 colon cancer patients and, and appendix cancer patients. Um, you know, so it, it cannot happen soon enough. And we, um, you know, th this is what motivates us to, to, to work, uh, to do is to bring this about as soon as possible. But, um, but there, there's a lot of reason for hope. Um, you know, one of the things that we're, another thing that we're very excited about is um, the, uh, the development of RAS inhibitors. So many of you may have heard of the KRAS G12C inhibitors. So that's sotorasib or antagrasib, um, which are, have, been, have been very effective in uh, colon cancer, lung cancer, pancreas cancer patients that have the KRAS G12C mutation. Uh, the problem is that's only about 3% of appendix cancer patients that have the, the G12C mutation. However, uh, a new drug is coming along. Um, th this one is from the company Marathi, MRTX1133, uh, uh, which inhibits KRAS G12D. And as you can see here, uh, G12D is like 30% of all uh, appendix cancer patients. So that's not 30% that's not of KRAS mutant, that's 30% of all appendix cancer patients. Um, and again, we have not yet tested this in a mouse. We're moving to that. I think actually that experiment is underway. Uh, we just don't have the results yet. But in cell lines, uh, these are organoids, so cells that are grown like as, as spheres. Um, the tumor that has the G12D mutation is very sensitive to this drug, whereas a control, if you have a different KRAS mutation, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, we're also very interested in this gene GNAS. So again, I, I told you that KRAS and GNAS tend to get mutated together. Um, in this system, we have a way to turn on the mutant gene ass, and when we do that, we see that the drugs become resist the, the the cells become resistant to our KRAS inhibitor. Um, and here, if we put in a mutant form of gene ass, the cells become resistant. But if we put in the, the wild type, then they then they don't. Um, and so, um, you know, MRTX one one three three is is just started its phase one testing um, at here at MB Anderson and at other places uh, around the country. I don't think it's gone international yet. Um, so we're very excited to um, develop mouse data in this, and hopefully we can convince Marathi to do an appendix cancer specific uh, clinical trial uh, for this drug. Uh, but that's this is just one of many RAS inhibitors. There are many other companies that are developing these. Uh, Revolution Medicine is one. Um, the um, so, you know, given that RAS mutation happens in, you know, over half of all appendix cancer patients, as, as more of these drugs come to the clinic uh, for clinical testing, um, you know, we think this is really going to be an opportunity uh, for targeted therapy, which has never really happened uh, in, in appendix cancer. Um, 
The um, there's also, I think, reason to believe that immune therapy um, could be active in uh, appendiceal cancer. Um, it, you know, this audience, you likely know that immune therapies have not worked very well uh, in colon cancer, with the exception of microsatellite unstable colon cancer. Uh, microsatellite unstable is about 10% of colon cancer, but it's only about 2% of appendix cancer. Uh, so for the for the you know the rare appendix cancer patients that have microsatellite instability, you know they're getting treated with immune therapy and they normally respond well. But um, we think that even the microsatellite stable, which is the 98%, may may respond um, in some circumstances to um, immune therapy. Um, so this this trial is not published yet. It will be reported in October uh, at at ESMO, which is the European Medical, sorry, it should be ESMO, European Society of Medical Oncology, uh, typo there. Um, so I can't I can't say more about that. But stay tuned for October, um, and it will got it, this this um, you can look up more details about it at, at clinicaltrials.gov. Um, uh, just, just we we can't speak at the, to the result until um, until it gets disclosed in October. Um, all right. So um, one of the um, so we're doing I think we're doing okay on time. Uh, we should have plenty of time for questions. Um, one of the questions that was asked by multiple people actually was, you know, what what should we look at in our path report and you know, what should we look at in our molecular report? And so we'll, we'll hop to that next. Um, so one, one thing is that, you know, appendix cancer is a rare cancer. And because it's a rare cancer, it, it's, it's important um, to have an expert uh, review your pathology. And so th this paper actually came from some colleagues of mine at the UC San Diego. Uh, Mark Valasek is a, is a appendix cancer specialist uh, pathologist. Um, Andy Lowy is a scientist and, and surgeon scientist, um, also an appendix cancer expert. Um, and basically what, what they did here is they looked at the pathology uh, ratings, like what did a community uh, pathologist describe this tumor, and then they re-reviewed it. Um, and about 30% of the time, uh, the diagnosis changed, uh, usually being the um, the you know, kind of the non-expert thought the tumor was actually more aggressive, higher grade um, than it really was. And so because, because the grade of the tumor is, is so important in appendix cancer, um, you know, we really feel it's important that you have an expert review uh, of the pathology. Um, also wanted to mention, um, you know, in terms of like, you know, what questions you should ask and what, um, you know, what you should be looking for in your report. Um, you know, Deborah and the ACP have put together a new patient guide uh, that you can get from their website um, that also includes, um, you know, some of the questions that, that you could ask. Um, so you, here is, um, so a lot of the times the diagnosis is going to be made off a of biopsy. Um, from a biopsy, the pathologist is just going to have a little bit of tissue. So like a, a core needle biopsy is like about three millimeters um, in width and, um, you know, and, and can be fairly long depending on how, how far they insert the needle. Um, so you want to pay attention to um, the grade. So in this case, moderately differentiated is kind of right in the middle. Um, and then um, what is the diagnosis? So this is a adenocarcinoma versus um, it could have been called a mucinous adenocarcinoma, could have been called a signet ring adenocarcinoma, could have been called a goblet cell adenocarcinoma. Um, th those are all, you know, different different things. Um, here, so here's an example. So this is a mucinous adenocarcinoma with signet ring cells features. So and, and the signet ring cell. Um, so they don't say this is a high grade tumor, but when you see signet ring cell, that means high grade. Um, those are very aggressive um, cancers. Um, and so now this is a path report from a from a surgery. So you know from a you you may not know this, but uh, when there's a cancer surgery, basically all of the the aspects of tumor, basically all of the specimens taken out um, of the body are sent to a pathologist to look at under the microscope. Uh, and you can see here, and they're just labeled in order, so A, B, C, D, E. Um, so you can see that there is no tumor in any of these first um, spots. But when you get down here to G, you can see that there is tumor. Um, and I, I picked this one because even within 
the same tumor, sometimes the 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 tumor doesn't look the same under the microscope. So, so same patient, you know, two different parts of the abdomen, two different physical tumors don't always look the same. Um, so you've got, um, and then a little more. So, so in the same patient, you have some moderately differentiated, so kind of middle grade tumor, but also uh, poorly differentiated, which is high grade tumor, um, and then in other areas, you have just, just mucin, uh, which a lot of times is like the remnant after the, you know, if the patient's had chemotherapy and, and it's responded, sometimes just the, the mucin is left. Um, so in a case like this, we would normally, uh, where we have a mixed grade, we have some, you know, moderate, which is medium grade and some poorly differentiated, which is high grade tumors you would generally classify this as a high grade tumor. You normally would classify the tumor based on the highest grade that is up there. Um, and so this is an example of a molecular report. Um, you know, it, it, you given the slide that I kind of showed at the beginning that based on the KRAS, GNAS, P53 mutation status, we can kind of stratify what the risk of relapse is. Um, you know, I think, Really, every patient I have with appendix cancer, I send for molecular testing. Um, that's not exactly standard, but I think it's it's becoming standard, and uh, we're working on developing national treatment guidelines. Um, we think that um, we can we, we can make this more standard. Uh, so important things to capture again: they're capturing the histology, so this is a mucinous adenocarcinoma. They're capturing the stage. Um, they're capturing the, so the tumor content is basically how much of the of the material that is in the tumor, how, uh, how much of it is actually tumor versus how much of it is either mucin, uh, which doesn't have cells in it, or normal tissue like immune cells or uh, fibroblasts, so that's called the stroma. Uh, so in this case, you see that's got a KRAS mutation and a GNAS mutation. It's microsatellite stable. The tumor mutation burden is basically the rate of mutation, so 3.3 is low. Um, it, numbers above 10 are associated with response to immune therapy, but unfortunately that's very rare in appendix cancer. Um, then, um, so the, you, different companies will do this kind of differently. So in this case, they're um, based on the mutations, they do a literature review. And so PMID stands for PubMed ID. So this means there's basically one paper that says that EGFR inhibitors don't work when you have RAS mutation. It turns out that's been shown in, in, in hundreds of patients and is, is absolutely true. Um, but there's also, you know, some of so it's hard. Um, at the end of the day, matching, you know, this mutation to this therapy is very difficult. I mean, this is something that we try to do, but it's hard uh, to predict. And so, um, you know, I can tell you that the link between GNAS mutation and responding to MEK inhibitor is, is much weaker than the link from EGFR, you know, inhibitors not working and, and KRAS, um, but on, honestly, it, it would be very hard. There's not like, there's not a simple thing I can tell you that is going to make it easier for you to interpret this. I mean, even, um, even clinicians who have been practicing for a long time, it's very difficult. Like even, you know, I've been studying cancer for essentially my entire life. Um, and it's still difficult for me. So it's hard. Um, it, it, there's not like an easy shortcut to, to understanding, um, you know, how to go from mutation to, to what drugs are going to work. Uh, it doesn't mean we don't try, but, uh, but it's difficult. Um, this is another example. Um, so you can see again, they're highlighting the, the TMB, to mutational burden low, which means immune treatment, uh, maybe not likely to work. Um, in this case, they found the same two genes that are mutated, GNAS and KRAS, um, and, and they show that the microsatellite is, is stable. Okay, so I think I did okay with not using up all the time um, and, and saving it for questions. Um, you know, before we move into the question part, um, I will, I just wanna thank um, all the members of our lab um, I want to thank uh, you know Dr. Scott Kopetz, who was uh, the the physician that recruited me to MD Anderson and and remains my mentor. Um, you know one of the world leaders in colon cancer treatment, uh, and also um, our surgeon colleagues, uh, Dr. Fournier, Dr. Helmick, Dr. White. I didn't put Dr. Scali's name on here, uh, but those are our 
our peritoneal surgeons, and then and, and Dr. Taggart, who is our expert pathologist. Um, again, the pathologist is, is such a critical part of the team. Uh, you know, as a um, as a patient, you don't see the pathologist because they're in the lab uh, with the microscope, but uh, they're really critical. And you know, their their uh, ability to say this is a high grade, this is a low grade tumor um, is, is really critical in our selection of chemotherapy or you know, deciding if you even need chemotherapy uh, at all. Uh, okay, so so let me let's um, let's break for questions. Um, so Deborah, do you want? Um, I've got a few of the questions loaded up. Should we start with those, or do you want to go? Is there anything hot off the press from what's been um, put in the the Q and A? Uh, no, I think that's great to go to your preloads. We do have a lot that came in, but but let's let's go ahead, Dr. Shen and knock out what you have, and then we can get to as many others as we can. Okay. All right. So, um, so this question, so many people have had tremendous results with chemotherapy and appendix cancers and, and get to, to NED, which is no evidence of disease. Um, you know, what are your thoughts on, on efficacy and how people are able to do this? Um, is it by histology? Uh, and what could explain this? And so I think, um, um, so I, I put this question first because I want, um, I definitely do not want uh, people to go home and say, you know, Dr. Shen says that chemotherapy doesn't work for appendix cancer. Um, you know, appendix cancer is not one disease, it's many diseases. Um, and in one subtype, which is low-grade mucinous, uh, you know, one type of chemotherapy, which is 5-FU and the 5-FU combinations don't work. Like that, that I will... Um, you know, that I'm very confident in saying, and I honestly, I would not treat another patient with that disease, uh, with low-grade mucinous disease with, with 5 FU. Um, so the, um, you know, it's an open question, like we, um, you know, again, that, that trial took, unfortunately, eight years to finish and another, you know, two years to write up. We're, we're working hard that you know, we don't want the, hopefully it's going to be like a waffle where like, you know, cooking the first waffle takes a long time, but now that the, the waffle iron is hot, we're hoping to, to, you know, complete trials and high grade at, at a much faster rate. And, um, you know, it's not, to my knowledge, no one has ever done a study that's really kind of looked at how do we predict what drugs work in high grade tumors. And we're, we're trying to do that. Um, the, the one thing I'll say is that you have to be a little bit careful using the term no evidence of disease in appendix cancer because we know that um, CT scans or, or MRI or PET, uh, they're all kind of notoriously bad at picking up small amounts of tumor that's left in the peritoneal cavity. Uh, and so the, the gold standard for saying there's no tumor left is really to do um, a surgical exploration, a diagnostic laparoscopy where you actually can visualize the entire abdomen uh, and either you know remove all the tumor or show that there's not any there. Because uh, unfortunately, if you just do a CT scan and use that as your standard of there's no tumor there, um, you're, you're going to miss a lot of cases where there is microscopic disease. And, and those are those are patients that might uh, benefit, say, from HIPEC, for example. Okay. Um, and so how would we share this information with the healthcare team if they aren't familiar with it without offending? So this is honestly, I, this is, I'm, I, you know, honestly, I would have never thought about this. Um, we're not in the question, but it's it's an important question. Um, you know, I think, um, you know, obviously everyone's, you know, doctors are people, um, or, you know, they're, you know, we're not all great equal. I mean, some of us are better than others and, you know, we have good days and bad days. Um, you know, but I think in general, if you don't feel that you're, if you don't feel like your, uh, physicians are listening to you, um, or they feel defensive, I mean, I think that that's kind of a problem, um, you know, I think you could, you know, one thing, you know, in general, um, you know, like, you know, as a practice oncologist, I get, um, you know, people suggest stuff all the time. Um, and there's, you know, sometimes ideas are a little bit crazy and we got to be like, no, we're not going to do that. But sometimes they're very good. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. I hadn't heard about that. Um, you know, there is, you know, hundreds of thousands of papers that are published every year, it's impossible for any one person to, to read all of them and, and to be aware of everything. Um, you know, so I think, you know, if you bring up and say, hey, this has, you know, been published on appendix cancer, you know, have you heard about this paper? It's, it's different if it's published in a peer-reviewed uh, journal, which is, which is why, 
you know, we're talking now about that low grade trial now that is published, uh, you know, because before it's published, people are, I think, um, reasonably skeptical. Uh, you know, to, to get published, it means that, you know, a, a group of scientists have all independently reviewed the paper and agreed that the results are valid. And so, um, you know, that's why the, the peer reviewed literature really is, is considered um, the gold standard. Um, so I think that, it, you know, if you bring it up in, in, in that fashion, like, hey, you know, this is new, not sure if you've heard about it. Um, you know, I, I would think people would be open to that, um, you know, from, um, you know, from a, um, you know, because this is such a rare disease, I mean, it's hard to expect someone to be able to be an expert in appendix cancer uh, if they only see it, you know, once every five years. Uh, and so, um, you know, this is why, you know, it's it's bet like if 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 you feel like your treatment team hasn't, I think it's a fair question to ask someone. You know, have you ever treated someone with a tumor like this before? Um, and you know, if the answer is no, you could. You know, I think it's it's fair to ask for a referral to a specialist. Um, you know, it's a lot. Um, I don't think that people will. Again, I can't speak for everyone's oncologist, um, but um, it, you know, figuring out hard you know, appendix cancer is hard to treat. And if you're a community oncologist that is having to see a lot of patients, you know, sending sending someone off to a specialist to have something, you know, come up with the plan for you um, is a good thing. You like, um, so we, we see patients that are referred from, you know, all over Texas and Louisiana, Arkansas, et cetera. And, you know, we, we have a very positive relationship with almost all the other oncologists we work with. You know, we say, hey, this is what we recommend. You know, this patient lives in, you know, Texarkana, so, you know, they're going to go to you and get the infusions every couple of weeks, but this is what we recommend and, and why, and, you know, very rarely do, you know, do we ever have um, that issue. Um, um, so hopefully, hopefully that, that, that's helpful. Um, any research on tumor infiltrating lymphocyte TILs or T-cell receptor-based therapies? Um, and any thoughts whether this might be potential treatment for appendicillin mucinous adenocarcinoma uh, with peritoneal metastases? Um, yeah, so um, put this question in. Um, so there's not much that I'm aware of in terms of T-cell receptor-based therapy. So this would be what like is called like CAR therapy, chimeric antigen receptor, uh, which is mostly right now being used in like leukemia lymphoma. Um, but um, you know we are excited about um, the PDL one um, or PDL one inhibitors uh, in combination to elicit a T cell response. Um, so overall, we're we're excited about um, immune therapy as an option uh, in appendix cancer. Um, uh, but stay tuned. We're, one of the other things we're working on in the lab is to make a, a immune competent model. Of appendix cancer, the the data that I showed you on paclitaxel, those are all uh, very immune compromised. In order to take a human tumor and have it grow in a mouse, you have to weaken the mouse immune system. So otherwise, the mouse would reject the the human tumor. Um, but if you're trying to study how an immune therapy works, you need a mouse that actually has an intact immune system. And so we're working on uh, with, with collaborators from from UC San Diego. We're working on building that. Um, and so, K so appendix cancer with KRSG12C, uh, do you think the combo of KRSG12C inhibitor with cetuximab could work? And I think, um, yes, potentially. Um, the, um, interestingly, um, like lung cancer with KRSG12C responds very well to just the single drug. Um, exact same mutation in colon cancer and you get some response with a single drug, but not, not a very deep response. And so there's lots of trials now that are looking at combinations, some with uh, cetuximab, some with uh, MEK inhibitors, uh, some with ERK, so lo lots of different combinations. And so, um, yes, I think that could be promising. Um, we're involved with some of these um, uh, KRS combination trials here at MB Anderson. Um, it, the, the, the complicated part in colon cancer is that there's not 
you know, in some patients, cetuximab might be the best drug to pair with it, but in other patients, it might be trametinib. It's probably not going to be the same. The same genes aren't going to cause resistance in every patient. That that that's what's going to make it complicated. Um, so we're really going to have to try to, you know, test the tumor up front and predict what's the best combo uh, for each patient. Uh, and, and while I've, you know, most of this talk, the theme is colon cancer and appendix cancer are different. In that case, I think that's one way that they'll be similar that, you know, what's the best combo is, is probably going to depend. Uh, what, one of the things we're working on with the GNAS story, so right now there's no GNAS drugs, uh, but we're working with a, a chemist also in San Diego uh, to make GNAS inhibitors. And we think that that combination of KRAS plus GNAS um, is going to be effective based on um, what we've done with, um, with genetic knockouts. Um, also, it's um, it, it's it's really an open question how effective cetuximab is in appendix cancer. Um, personally, I have treated um, several appendix cancer patients with um, panitumumab, which is very similar to cetuximab, um, and in combination, and we've seen some response. But um, when you're doing it, I've never done just cetuximab by itself. I've always done cetuximab plus a retikan. Um, or cetuximab plus uh, fulfiri. So it's hard to know, is the cetuximab itself uh, doing something? But that's something that we're trying to, um, to study both in the lab and going back and looking retrospectively at, at patients who have gotten treated with this um, to identify, can we, can we predict if that would work? Because it, um, you know, we, we, any, any additional effective therapy in appendix cancer will be, will be really valuable. Okay, so so, so that, that's all the questions I kind of preloaded. Do we you do want to you want to maybe take the screen and load or just read them and I'll respond. What do you think? Uh, yeah, well, I've been trying as you've been um, speaking, Dr. Shen, to kind of bucket some of the things coming in, but we can do this however you want. I just want to thank you though for that presentation, and I think that was tremendous. And you just took a lot of really complicated things. And I think distilled them down um, really nicely for for those of us that are that are not um, clinicians. But just really quickly, because I see that they're on the mutation subject, um, a couple of questions that I think you could probably answer pretty quickly. One was um, a very straightforward one: is you're talking about the importance of uh, pathology expert reviewing the pathology report, um, getting the second opinion. How does one find a pathology expert? Or could they assume that if they go to a high volume center with expert yeah. medical oncologists like yourself? Yeah, I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah great question. So, you know, unfortunately, you can't, um, you know, as a patient, you can't pick your pathologist I and mean, you can pick your physician. Um, but you can't pick your pathologist, but the, the, you know, the expert appendix, the, the way that you become an expert pathologist in appendix cancer is by, you know, reviewing a lot of appendix cancer cases. And so that means that you want to go to a high volume center, um, because, because that basically, that's what makes you an expert. Great. And any value in your opinion in doing biomarker genomic sequencing testing for Lamins, low grade appendiceal neoplasms. Oh, uh, for la well, um, it, it, you know, I mean, as a data scientist, I'm always in favor of generating, you know, molecular data. Um, but it's um, it would be unlikely to change treatment recommendation. Uh, the, the, uh, the good thing about lamin is that you know. The risk of a lamin coming back isn't zero, but it's very low. And um, you know, similarly, like if you think about lamin on a spectrum of low-grade appendix cancer, lamin is even like lower than that because it's not uh, invasive. So that so, what what makes a lamin a lamin versus a low-grade appendix appendiceal adenocarcinoma is that a by definition, the adenocarcinoma has to be invading. So like if you look at it under the microscope, the, the cells don't kind of respect the normal order, they invade across uh, at least a little bit. Uh, and so that's like the T stage. 
um, in your TNM staging. Um, so like T4 would be all the way, you know, start it from the inside. Appendix cancers start on the inside of the appendix. T4 means it went all the way through. You know, T1 is it just went to the first layer. Lamin is not invasive. So um, if there's a if there's a question um, about whether this is really a lamin or it's invasive. That's really, at this point, that's still really a microscope-based question. You know, are we seeing tumor invasion or not? Um, you know, I'm, from a research standpoint, I'm very curious what, what genes are mutated in lamin because we're, you know, we think that basically some lamins will eventually progress in and become invasive and, and become adenocarcinoma. And so if we had Lamin sequence, it would kind of be like looking back earlier in time, and it would help us kind of understand what's the process of normal cell takes, you know, to actually becoming invasive adenocarcinoma. Uh, kind of like uh, in breast cancer, people have done a lot of work sequencing ductal carcinoma in situ, uh, not necessarily because they need to treat DCIS, but but because it, it helps them understand you know, actual invasive breast cancer because it's the, the precursor. So, so lamin, you can kind of think of like, you know, like, um, you know, DCAS or like benign polyp in, in colon cancer. So I think from a research standpoint, it's a long, long answer, but I think from a research standpoint, yes, but it's unlikely to change your, um, you know, any one person's clinical uh, care. Okay, good. And then just one more on the mutations. I don't know if there's anything that you can speak to on this, but Someone had asked if you could talk a little bit about ATM mutations, and I'm not familiar with those. Yeah, at all. okay, yeah. So that that stands for ataxia telangia mutated. Um, so ATM is so ATM can be mutated. So, um, so just big picture, there's two two classes of mutations in cancer. So you have you have genes that should be kind of turned off that get turned on all the time. Those are called oncogenes. So like KRAS. GeneAS, those are genes that um, their function should be off, but the mutation switches them on all the time. Um, and the drugs basically block the, you know, it's switched on all the time and the drug comes along and blocks the protein from doing it. Um, ATM is the other type of mutation. So, a, so mutations in ATM disrupt the function of the gene. So ATM is normally a gene that should um, regulate the the like cell cycle and and repair of DNA damage. So basically, the ATM is kind of like senses like, hey, the DNA is damaged. Uh, we should stop dividing and basically shut the shell down. That's kind of like a, a simple way to think of what what it does. Um, so if you don't have that, like you don't have this break that says, hey, we should um, we shouldn't keep dividing. You you're going to get more division, and so that's. So those genes are called tumor suppressor genes. So these are genes that should be suppressing the, you know, cancer phenotype, the, the division, uh, but they're mutated and they don't work anymore. Um, so what's difficult about that is that you can't, so ATM mutant, like ATM is already not working. Um, so you can't make a drug to make it not work because it's already not working. But um because ATM actually does important things in the cell, it creates the fact that you don't have a working version of ATM anymore creates a vulnerability um, to another drug. And so we've had some success uh, in ATM mutant um, appendix cancers with drugs that block a related gene called ATR. Uh, and so that's um, a lot of that work has been led by Tim Yap at MD Anderson. He's, the, Tim Yap is kind of our DNA repair um, clinical trial specialist. Uh, he's also done a lot of work with the uh, we one inhibitors, PARP inhibitors, kind of all the DNA damaging drugs. Uh, and so there's a lot of, um, this is the same idea of like how PARP inhibitors work. So if, if the tumor has the BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation, you don't have a drug against BRCA1 or BRCA2, but you have a drug against uh, PARP and the tumor with the BRCA mutation dies. And so um, this you know, the BRCA PARP story is much farther along than the ATM, ATR. Or there's other partner genes that people are looking at with ATM, uh, but it's definitely um, possible. Uh, and there's definitely trials out there that, um, you know, would take, um, 
ATM mutant patients. Also, in addition to being mutated, sometimes ATM is deleted. So cancers can cancers can change the DNA in lots of ways. One is they actually change the sequence. That's a mutation. Uh, but sometimes just whole parts of the genome can get deleted. And so ATM is 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 maybe as much as 10% of appendix cancers have the part of the genome where ATM is supposed to be just deleted. So then the protein is just gone. Okay, good. Now we've got quite a few questions, a lot of interest in uh, your paclitaxel trial, which we understand is not yet enrolling, but lots of interest about it. Um, what, in terms of eligibility, are there specific histologies? Is this too early to answer? I mean, is well, this yeah, so for it's low still, grade, um, high grade? Yeah. It's, a great, it's a great question. Um, the We want to do this kind of as the, the plan, again, it hasn't, gone to into our, our IRB or internal review board yet so they may they may change what our plans are um but uh, we wanted to kind of keep the eligibility as broad as possible um we because because we don't it's worked in the three uh tumors that we've tested in mice thus far but we don't necessarily have a great um um a great molecular predictor um, you know, so we, we think that this could be effective in low-grade tumors and, and high-grade tumors. Um, the, the, we, would, we would definitely limit it to, um, you know, non, people that could not undergo um, CRS high you know, if, if you're able to undergo the complete set of reduction high that's that's the standard of care. And so you should, you should do that if possible. Um, so that this, is, this would be for people who are not operable. Um, and it would be for people whose disease is limited to the peritoneum. So rarely, like maybe 10% of the time, you can get appendix cancer spreads outside of the peritoneal cavity. Uh, and, you know, because this trial is putting the drug into the peritoneal cavity, if you've got distant spread, that would not be a good a good fit. But other than that, we were trying to, to include, you know, high-grade, high low-grade, uh, GNAS mutant, P53 mutant, um, we, you know, goblet cell histology is less common, but I don't, we weren't planning to exclude goblet cell. Um, you know, we were planning to take both mucinous and non mucinous. Great. That sounds really promising. Um, and then someone had asked, I think you just kind of answered this. I assume the answer is basically the same, but if someone is one of the 2%, currently responding to immunotherapy, um, could we assume then that they probably, this paclitaxel trial or any clinical trial would probably not be recommended because they're already responding? We, so in general, I mean, um, you know, my rule as oncology generally, if we have a treatment that's working, I mean, almost never would I stop a treatment that's working and switch to something. I mean, like there are rare situations. Um, and I guess if, if the treatment is working, but it's like too toxic, you know, people can't handle it anymore, then you would switch. But, um, you know, if, if, if you got, uh, we say like, it's like uh, Vegas, if you're on a heater, you got, you got to press it. So, I mean, because the, there's no guarantee that the next treatment is going to work for you specifically. So in general, if you're on something that you're tolerating, so obviously, I mean, it, you know, if you're on like oxaliplatin and you're getting neuropathy, then regardless if it's working, you got, you got to stop that. But, um, you know, the, one of the best aspects of immune therapy is there's not a lot of cumulative toxicity. Um, you, know, you know, some people are going to have an immune reaction, um, but generally, if, if you don't, you know, we don't see that the risk of that, um, we don't see that the risk of side effects goes up over time, whereas with traditional chemotherapy, um, it definitely, you know, eventually everyone is going to get fatigued and get low blood counts and with oxyplatin get neuropathy uh, if you give them enough of it. Um, so, you know, we don't want, and, 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 and actually th this is actually, a probably where we will have to probably will be required by the RIB to put this in our trial, but most trials will require that you've progressed, uh, on your prior therapy. Like they won't, they generally will not allow you're on something that's already working, just switch over and join the trial. N normally they're normally it would be, um, Progression would be required. So, so we were also planning to allow both frontline, you know, like the, the, another question is, would we mandate that patients would have to have another therapy before going on trial? Uh, we weren't planning on that, but um, in reality, 
you know, most, most, but especially at MD Anderson, by the time people, I mean, unfortunately, it's hard to get in because um, there's a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of people with cancer and, and uh, there's only uh, so many of us, um, you know, there's delayed. So we're, I mean, it's, we get probably three times as many patients who have already had treatment and are coming to us versus people who have never had um, treatment. Sometimes we get people who have never had treatment. We like, we like having, you know, patients that have never had treatment. But um, in reality, it will most likely be patients who have already had at least one uh, prior chemotherapy. Okay. And then there's one scope question that we've got different variations of. It goes back, Dr. Shen, to your recent study, your recent paper um, about um, the efficacy or questions of efficacy with low-grade disease, low-grade adenocarcinoma, presumably lamin too. But the question we, we get a lot is, so for high-grade uh, appendiceal histologies, it is still the case that 5-FU-based chemo regimens, for example, Folfox, that, that there's nothing to suggest that that would not be, a, could that that could still be possibly effective. You're not, your yeah, paper's sorry, not yeah, saying, so, yeah. you know, Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for yeah. So again, so the you know the the um, the study with on five was 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 limited to low grade mucinous tumors, and so um, yeah. you know one of the one of the early things that you're taught in medical school is that if you have a clinical trial, you have to you know ask yourself what is the study population, and if if the patient that you're looking at you know doesn't meet the study population, you know likely the conclusions of that don't apply. And so, you know, that's, the, you know, pet, you know high-grade tumors are very different than low-grade tumors. Um, I, I think it's only because if you think about like, so ovarian cancer, uh, high-grade high grade serous ovarian cancer has a completely different treatment algorithm than, than low-grade ovarian cancer. Uh, I think the only reason that's not the case in appendix cancer is that it's rare. Um, if there were, you know, a you know, hope, thankfully, they'll never, hopefully, they'll never be, you know, 30,000 appendix cancer cases a year. Uh, but if there were, I think you'd have very clear different treatments for a high and low grade. They're, they're that different. So the um, the conclusions about low grade, you know, absolutely should not be applied to high grade. Um, you know, we, at least in uh, mucinous high grade tumors, uh, my practice is to start with an arena TCAN based regimen, so full fury and not um, full fox. Um, but the, the the data on that is um, is kind of equivocal, and so it um, you know we're working on trying to we're working on trying to because you know, in in reality some of the tumors are going to respond to both full fox and full fury. Some of them are going to respond to neither. You know, some are going to do better with you know arena TCAN some with oxyacetin, like, you know, how ultimately we're trying to figure out the answer to how we differentiate that, but it's, it's an open question. And, um, you know, I think, it, you know, I, I wouldn't criticize anyone for making, you know, picking full Fox first, full fury first. Um, there's just, there's just not enough data to, to say one is right and one is wrong. Okay, good. Now I'm looking at our time. We've got three minutes. We've covered actually quite a few of the topics. This is going to be challenging, Dr. Shen, but can you give like a, a one minute overview on what well, two things? One, just a quick, quick, uh, what do we, what are we talking about when we're talking about microsatellite instability or Ooh. as I would say on the report, MSI high versus stable? That's one. And then very quickly, um, Lots of questions about surveillance. What is the appropriate surveillance methodology? I'm sure your answer is going to be in part depending on the histology, but what is it? Is it imaging? Is it is it lab tests with blood markers? Is it some combination of of all? So go. Okay, yeah. So great. So it's a great great. So the 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 first MSI high, so it stands for microsatellite instability high. Um it's sometimes called mismatch repair deficient. Um, and so basically this means that the tumor can't repair uh, these like kind of single base mismatches. And so because of that, the mutation rate gets really high. So like the couple examples that I showed like had like three 
three mutations per megabase, so basically three errors per million. But like an MSI high tumor might have like 70 or 80. So the this the number of the number of mutations in the tumor is very high. Um, and what that what what happens is that when you have that many mutations, the the DNA gets turned into RNA and then the RNA gets turned into protein. And if you've got an error in the, the, the sequence, you make a protein that's abnormal. Uh, and that's important because if you make enough of those abnormal proteins, the immune system will recognize some of them. And now the immune system will be activated uh, against the tumor. And so uh, we've learned basically that these MSI high microsatellite unstable high tumors are basically primed to respond to an immune therapy. And so those are the tumors that respond very well to the drugs like atezolizumab, um, you know, nivolumab, pembrolizumab, like the, the study where there was like 100% response rate in neoadjuvant rectal cancer. Those were all MSI high tumors. So those, those tumors respond very well to immune therapy. Uh, unfortunately, it's only 2% of, of appendix cancer. Um, so the question about surveillance is, is great. So, um, you know, so just like the chemotherapy for colon cancer, just like the chemotherapy for appendix cancer was built off of the guidelines for colon cancer, the surveillance of appendix cancer has also been built off of the surveillance, sorry, the surveillance for appendix cancer has been built off of the surveillance for colon cancer. Um, th that's another active area that we're working on. Um, the so probably the frequency could be less just because appendix cancer grows slower, but I would, until we have better data on that, um, you know, I think the colon cancer guidelines are okay. The, um, you know, CT scans are always going to underestimate um, disease in the peritoneum, but there's really not a better, we don't really have anything better. Um, at MD Anderson, we like to use CT scans um, some places, might prefer MRI. It, it's kind of dependent on on the radiologist um, and it, you know the limitation of both the limitation applies to any kind of cross sectional method. So MRI, you're getting slices. You know, CT, you're getting slices. Um, you can think you know if you have a tumor that coats surfaces, so it's kind of like the paint on the wall. Like if you're looking at the wall like directly at it, you can see it's painted. But if you look at you know if you take a slice of that wall you know, and you're trying to see, is that paint a little bit thicker um, or not? That's basically trying to find appendix cancer on a CT scan or an MRI. And so um, we've actually done a lot of work to see, can you use circulating tumor DNA? So basically draw the blood and look for tumor DNA in the blood. Uh, that's actually working very well for colon cancer. Uh, and it works okay for uh, appendix cancer, but again, it, um, it works better for higher grade tumors and lower grade tumors. Um, we, there's a, we, we, we we're about to publish this, uh, as well. Um, but in a lot of patients with low grade disease, uh, we know that they have tumor. We can see it on the scans, but we still can't pick up the, the DNA in their blood. Um, it's still worthwhile though, because when you do see DNA in the blood, it, it shows, tells you that the tumor is more aggressive. Um, it tells you that there's like more microscopic invasion and, uh, it's a, it's a prognostic marker. So we're still... We're still doing that, uh, but we're just not a great. Um, so um, oh, the other thing that I should say is that measuring the tumor markers is an important um, part of surveillance. So uh, th this is another manuscript that is in preparation and, and will be submitted soon, but you should measure it. So um, in colon cancer, normally you just check the CEA. Uh, in appendix cancer, you should check the CEA, the CA199, and the CA125. Um, you know, appendix cancer is very heavy. So like some tumors will only make one of the three. And if you only check CEA, you might miss an elevated CA199 um, or a CA125, which is a pretty decent marker that your, your tumor um, has come back. Uh, we've actually showed that um, if you measured them at diagnosis, having an elevated, um, you know, tumor marker is, is, is a poor prognostic indicator. But um, basically, if all the markers are negative, uh, you know, certainly we found in a cohort of about um, about almost 700 people that like like 98% of people were alive at five years if at the time of diagnosis, at the time of diagnosis, you know, CEA, CA199, CA125 were all normal. Um, so we think that in the future, this might be part of the, at, might be part of the staging. Um, so we could identify, you know, maybe people who don't need adjuvant chemo after they've had resection 
et cetera. So, so, so long answer, you know, staging is um, surveillance is, is changing um, as we get more data. Um, you know, I think that the, the one thing I would say definitely is when you're getting your blood work check, check all three tumor markers, not just CEA, which is the, in the colon guidelines. Um, I would, for now, I would stick to the colon frequency just because we don't have enough data to replace that, although I think that will change in the future. Um, you know, and the, you know, we, we routinely do ctDNA. We know that ctDNA doesn't work as well in colon, in appendix cancer as it does in colon cancer, uh, but we still do it. Um, I mean, it's not, it, it's not proven, but, you know, until we actually start doing it, we never would be able to prove it. That's kind of our attitude. And so um, when it's when it's positive, it's helpful. Um, you know, if we detect tumors in your blood, almost certainly you've got tumor cells in you somewhere. Uh, when it's negative, it's hard. It's not as helpful because it's, we can't, we, with appendix cancer, you can't be super confident in a negative, meaning there really is no tumor. But, 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 you know, when it's positive, it's very helpful, and and, and it allows you to catch the, the tumor earlier. Um, uh, but that's really it. The um, the other the other thing would be, um, you know, after, it, you know, it, the chance that chemotherapy by itself is going to eradicate the tumor is very low. Um, you know, we think maybe like one in a thousand or one in ten thousand. Like, are you going to go from, you know large amount of tumor to like absolutely eradicate it, you're cured. Um, it's not zero, but it's very low. And so that means that if you've had your induction chemo and um, it looks like there's nothing left on a scan, that that's when you would need to do the diagnostic surgery, the diagnostic laparoscopy to actually visualize is there tumor left? Because there probably is tumor left that you just can't see in a CT scan. And that that's where you'd want to consolidate that with, uh, you know, remove the tumor that you found on the diagnostic lab or, or do a, do a high fire. And so um, I've, I've seen a couple of unfortunate cases where people got chemo and they, well, we didn't see it on the scan anymore, but they never had surgery to, to actually evaluate that. And, um, uh, and then, you know, the tumor came back, um, you know, several years later. Okay. That you this has been tremendous i hope everyone listening in has gotten something out of it i know we couldn't answer all of the questions but we have done our level best to get to as many as we can uh dr shen thank you so so much for all of your time all of your expertise really appreciate it i want to thank my acpmp colleagues as well jim carroll the president uh, of the board is on on this call, as well as Alyssa Strackbein, our ops coordinator, who's handled all the tech stuff. But thank you, patients, caregivers, clinicians, all of you for your time participating. And uh, we'll keep doing these programs and, you know, knowledge is power. So thank you for giving us some knowledge and giving us some power, Dr. Shen. Don't worry. Right. Thanks, uh, thanks for having me and uh, okay. thanks everyone for tuning in. Thank you. Okay. Good night.